So in order to display the, uh, just my content here without your chat and all that. I think you can, um, let me get rid of this chat. Because I'm, answer. obviously I'm sharing. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Can I, uh, My question to you is, oh, you really want to work for the government? Well, good, because we need people like you to work for the government. So some disclaimers, um, everything I'm going to say is, so my views and my opinion are my own, and also represent uh, the opinions of my employer or the government employees. So any questions or anything, please contact me. Um, so a little bit about me. So. You can read the left part, which is basically what's on my resume. Uh, I have some associates, computer networking, then eventually I got my information systems, uh, bachelor's in information systems. Eventually I crossed train to the uh, cybersecurity field, and then you know, I went for my master's. I got, I got some uh, vendor uh, certifications that you can see. And basically my whole, whole career was going from IT operations, eventually cross training to uh, cybersecurity. Um, when I did that, I started as a help desk, <clears throat> then became a systems engineer. Then I started working for NASA as a cybersecurity uh, analyst uh, in their secure operations center. Now I'm currently working for Fortinet as an incident responder, incident handler, however you want to call it. I also did uh, eight years of in the Air Force. Um, I in the Air Force Reserve, and I did one deployment, which was awesome. But so that was, like I said, that was how it was on my resume, but what was my path to actually start working for the government, how I was inspired to work for the government? Well, first of all, when I was 17, I was in high school, I dropped out of high school, and really know what to do. So then I joined this program called Arizona Project Challenge. It was run by the Arizona Air National Guard, or uh, Army National Guard. And basically what they were able to provide me was my GED, but also uh, it was a five month boot camp. So after I completed that program, I got my GED, and then I would have familiarity with how the, uh, uh, the army life worked. Because, you know, I'm on boot camp, I mean, come on. So you, they, they drill me into my head, you need to be in the military. After that, I pursued joining the military right away. Didn't work out, that's when the uh, Iraq war started uh, for some reason that I don't know, I still don't know. Uh, I was not there. And sometimes the reasons I said why I wasn't there is because it wasn't my time. One example, one of my coworkers or teammates when I was in Arizona Project Challenge, he actually went straight from Arizona Project Challenge to the army. Then the war in Iraq started and a few months later he died. So it was meant to be, I wasn't supposed to be there. So I joined the community college, kind of like you guys, and I started pursuing uh, my um, associates in computer networking, webmaster, and what else. Uh, 
after finishing those, then that's when I joined the Air Force. And I didn't join the Air Force active duty, I joined the reserve because I wanted my civilian career, but also I wanted to serve my country. And that was one of the things that I, for me was valuable, serve my country. Like I said, I did one deployment with the Air Force. And then once I returned, I was able to finish my bachelor's and then eventually landed on my dream job, which was a systems engineer. I was doing that for probably a year when I decided, yeah, I have to do something else in my career. And I didn't really know what to do until I found cybersecurity. That's when I started looking into, okay, I have to do uh, a master's. There's no point to go back to do a bachelor's or associate's or anything like that. So then um, I got my, my master's and that's when eventually moved to Silicon Valley. Now, one thing I have to say about moving to Silicon Valley, it was one of the greatest things I ever had done, but also it was one of the challenges uh, because uh, the, the jobs in the area, they require you to have experience, certifications, uh, and, but the, the, the education doesn't really care in this area, just in this area. I, I have to make that comment. Just in this area, sometimes it's not as important, but you must have uh, certifications and um, uh, experience. So that's basically how was my path to, to, to work for the government. Now, when I moved to the Silicon Valley area, I didn't have a, um, experience. I only have the masters. The people who were actually looking for, um, for cybersecurity analysts was NASA. Well, I was a perfect candidate because government likes people with degrees. They like people with certifications or experience, and they also love people who already have a security clearance. Well, because I already have a master's and at least I already have my security clearance, it was easy to get in to the government and working for NASA than actually working for the private sector. So that's when I started working for NASA. I did that for a year and a half until eventually I, I moved to the private sector. Um, again, uh, I, I have really good and bad experiences working for the government, but I'm not discouraging anybody to, 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 to just see the bad things. There's also really good things that happen. So now I'm just gonna jump into how can you work for the government? Well, first of all, you must be a US citizen. And also, you must be able to get a security clearance. Uh, the military, they actually have some positions. Uh, if you're a green, green card holder, you, you are accepted, but the, the jobs are limited. Um, also, same thing with the civil servants. And, and contractor, well, it's a basically a no-no. Um, so the military. So if you don't know anything about the military, I'm gonna give you a crash course on how the military works so you can start understanding more about it. So the military is composed of five branches, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard. And out of those five, five branches, there's three components. And you probably hear them in the new, uh, on commercials and stuff like that. Uh, active duty, reserve, and guard. Now the guard is only works for our active, uh, Air Force and Army. And the, the, Two ways you can be in the military is by being an officer or an enlisted. Now, in order to become an officer, you must have a four-year degree, so you have to have a bachelor's. Enlisted, there's not really a requirement. So I kind of listed the pros and cons about it. Uh, the pros, well, if you're gonna go enlisted right straight out of high school, or you just decide to do something bigger than what you're currently doing, something exciting, then you don't have, you need to have experience, and the, the degrees are not required. They're gonna pay for your training, um, for the, uh, you know, just to train yourself, and then on the job training, um, you can get free education. And also, I have to say that you will learn things in the military that you probably will not learn anywhere else. Um, also, with, with that comes great benefits, especially if you're active duty. Active duty means you're full-time, versus reserve and guard, you are the, one week in a month, two weeks a year, worry. Uh, when you're active duty, you can get free healthcare, free insurance, free housing, uh, and retirement once you hit your 20 years. Some of the cons. Sorry. Only 20 years. Yes. Wow. If you're active duty. Yeah. Um, some of the cons is in order to join the military, you have to meet physical standards. 
you also have to pass some tests, which math, reading, a bunch of stuff like that. And they, based on that score, they will put you on their jobs. And, and like I said, I mentioned earlier, able to get a clearance. Also, the military is not known for paying you a lot. It is very low pay. You do a lot of work, but you also get a lot of things, you know, once you're out. Someone have a question? Oh, um, and once you're in the military, basically you're not free. I have to say, once you have a security security clearance, you are part of the government. The government kind of owns you. So if you have to travel outside of the country or or do something, you have to let them know. And sometimes if they if you're going to a country that is not allowed, they will decline your trip. And regardless, if you already pay for it or not. Now. Every time I um, advise someone when they ask me about the military, I always say this quote, uh, not everybody fits in the military culture, but for the ones who do, there is a branch for every person. It is not a one branch fits all. The way I put it is, if you like um, uh, hiking, if you like uh, camping, the army is the way to go. If you like travel, if you like to be in five-star hotels, the, the best of the best, join the Air Force or the Navy. <clears throat> if you are egocentric, if you like to hit the gym every morning, you are the guy who wants to show up, join the Marines. So they're great about it. The Coast Guard, I haven't really talked to the Coast Guard much, but you know, if you like fishing, hey, why not? <laughs> right? So that's one way to say. So Again, as you can see, every, every branch is different. And I can say from experience, uh, being the Air Force was one of the best things I, I, I could say. I was able to visit countries and places that I, I never, probably was gonna take me longer to, to be able to go to those places and actually stay in really nice hotels because the Air Force has really good hotels, believe it or not. Uh, moving forward, civil servant. That's the government employee. You can work as in federal agencies, kind of such as the FBI, CIA, DHS, NSA, DOD, um, or the, the state, the county. So again, some pros. Uh, they don't require you to have experience. However, the higher the degree you have, the more pay is gonna come. They also provide uh, pay training, so you need a certification, they will pay for it. They will provide you on the job training and some great benefits. Not as good as the military. For example, the retirement might be 25, 30 years versus the military is only 20. Uh, and, but they do provide cheap healthcare. So um, one of the cons, you must have degrees, uh, whether it's an associate, bachelor's, uh, master's, PhDs. Like if you look at the, uh, um, some of the job descriptions, if you want to get a GS 11, GS 12, you must have a, must have a PhD. I'm like, really? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Be able to get a security clearance. And again, you're not free. So I just want to make that comment. Um, one thing before I move on this, uh, I was going to show you some of the um, websites. It's better than VA, right? You always hear those stories about the VA has the crappy healthcare. So I guess in civil, it would be better than the VA healthcare system. Well, you know, believe it or not, I was, I was, you know, I there's a lot of people. It says cheap, so I'm thinking, how bad can it Cheap healthcare? Well, like insurance, but not, so I'm glad you, you point that out. Not cheap as in bad, cheap as in low cost. So, so I'm glad you point that out. So it's like Kaiser quality, right? You know, sometimes it's better. If you oh. go to the, the VA um, in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. I was surprised how they treat people, how... Uh, my, ha my wife had to go there for a um, uh, appendix removal and how they treat her, they, they, how they act on it, like, I was impressed. They didn't I, use your records, you know, they didn't, oh, you made an appointment with, oh, we don't see your appointment. <laughs> right, no, you know, actually, I hear that a lot, not in this hospital. Now, other uh, hospitals might be like that, not this one in specific. This one, I actually was surprised. I was like, wow. Um, give me a second, let me show you. Um, this is the uh, uh, military pay chart for this year. So at least you can suck in and, and, and you know how much you're gonna get. So if you start from the lowest grade, which is E1, this is how, we, how much it's gonna make a month, 60, 
you know, almost 1,700 a month. You know, obviously in this area, it's nothing, but, uh, you know, that's how much you're gonna get. And, and they do provide like, like say BAH, which is a base allowance for housing, and then BAS, uh, base allowance for, you know, stuff like that. Um, but then if you're a, uh, uh, an officer and serve at the lowest level, look at the difference. This one is having a degree, the other one is not having a degree. So you can see almost double, right? Um, so here you go. So having a degree and be, you know, joining the military with a degree will pay you more. Not comparing to what the private sector pays you, but you know, better. Um, um, you also get things like on the scholarship. Correct, yeah, right. yeah. Which compared to here could be a lot. Actually, there's a scandal about base housing where like they don't keep up their houses or like the roof may be leaking or some other issues like, I thought this was not so yeah, I heard some yeah. stories about their house, whoever manages or a third party contractor does a lousy job in some locations where you're expecting to be fixed, they're not really fixed. So I have to say, so we both, <laughs> we both live in, in mili military housing or government housing. And, and we, we hear that a lot, but, so, yeah, so, so. <laughs> so my, my AC broke for three weeks and two. Yeah, no, no, it's not all, so just the equipment. Yeah, the houses where we live, we, you know, so I have to say, I live in Silicon Valley for free. No, no one will provide me that. And that's because my wife is an active year. Uh, now the house, like she said, it's really nice, but some of the uh, equipment is not as up to grade. Yeah. But there's other bases around the area that the same company that, that manage ours, manage them. And we just hear all these complaints that the, uh, the, the, the rats are, you know, in their, uh, like underground or something like that. I don't know, it's like, Chris is like, really? Like, I haven't heard that story, but okay, all right. I just want to make an observation. My wife's brother is a Coast Guard commander, yeah. and we travel all over the United States and stay at the base recreational home. Yeah. I mean, it's been fantastic. Yeah, yeah. see, exactly. <laughs> you cannot, you know, some places will be good. I'm, I'm going back to what I said earlier. Army housing, they're not the greatest. Where we live is actually or like the bases that are in the area are army housing and they have all these complaints. Where we live is actually uh, run by the army, but they're not really from the army. So, but yeah, depending where you go, uh, you know, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see a big difference. Um, this is for the government, um, just showing you where you can find the information. This is how much you start uh, earning if you start working for the government uh, as an employee. Uh, you start with um, GS1, and GS1 only pays 26,000. Uh, and as you go up, you will see that you start earning more. Now, kind of like in the with the with the military, like you have a rank and uh, time in service and stuff like that. They go by steps, and you probably probably start with GS9, but then you go by step one, two, three, four, five, ten, and then maybe they jump for you into GS10. Uh, Laura is going to explain more about it uh, once she has her turn, but uh, I, at least you start seeing the numbers. Again, they're not com uh, as good pay as compared to the, uh, um, the private sector. So, so they're not going to upgrade anytime soon, it's just going to be still the same old stuff. It's not like they're going to have a cyber division, it's always going to be military, right? Um, no, well, I'm going to go over <laughs> <You know? laughs> No, I'm going to go over that. So no, because we were actually on... on on our drive here, um, we were talking about it. Um, there's actually big, being a lot of big changes, especially last year and this year, um, to where they, uh, they're they lowering the, uh, the requirements even to join the military. And I'm actually gonna go over that. Uh, okay, so as a contractor, where can you work as a contractor? Well, whatever, there is a company where they can, they have contracts with the military. Usually you find them in cities where there is a lot of government and military presence, such as San Diego. San Diego has the Navy bases where the uh, Navy SEALs train, and also you have the, uh, the Marine bases uh, uh, where they have their Marine boot camp. Um, and also they have other projects there. Uh, so a lot of government work. Um, 
some of the good things about it. If you work for the go, uh, a contractor, sometimes you can work overseas and you can get tax free. So that the money that you make overseas is not taxable. And if, depending on where you are, you might be working for a contractor in Afghanistan or Iraq and stuff like that. You get paid extra allowances for because you're in combat zone and stuff like that. So uh, with that being said, sometimes the pay might, might not be might not be really good compared to private sector. But if you're going to be making tax-free money, well, compared to the private sector, actually, it's way more money. So, pros, more money than the, the uh, government work or military, but less than private sector. But again, you have to make the comparisons. Now, cons, the benefits are very standard. Um, it is the same, uh, pretty much the same benefits as the one that you find in a private sector, 401k, um, you know, your, okay, your standards. Say that again? 401k, most companies got rid of those. No, of course. Yeah, some, no. some kept them, but some yeah. stories I heard, yeah. Yeah, um, they also, they need uh, what I call uh, unicorns. Why I call unicorns? Because in order to work for a, a contractor, you need experience, you need degrees, you need certifications, and you need a clearance. Also, if you're gonna be working in IT or security for, um, for a contractor, you need to be DOD 8571 compliant. And I'm gonna show you here, what, what is that? So IAT level one, you must have an A plus, CCNA security, network plus, SSCP. Just by looking at the first section without going in detail with the other ones, that sounds like a lot of money between training and certifications. So just in order to work for them, you already need to fulfill one of them. Now, sometimes depending on the requirement, they might ask for level one, level two, or level three. But at least, I mean, look at it. This class right here, $6,500 uh, plus another thousand for the certification test. That's a SANS class. That's another SANS class. This is a Cisco class, CIS speed, uh, your CISA and then your cask. Uh, again, make the math. That, that right there is close to 2025, just based on that. So that's why I always say uh, contractors, they look for unicorns because, so the, the, the usual path when you work for the government is either you join the military, they give you the, uh, the uh, security clearance, then you start working either for a government agency or for a contractor, because now you have a clearance and you start, uh, you know, you fulfill basically all the requirements and you start making more money. Um, so here's where I'm gonna be going through the uh, IT and InfoSec opportunities. And definitely the government has a lot of opportunities for you. Uh, so in order to go to find more about them, I will suggest go to the each branch um, website, uh, if it's military, uh, if, it's, if you're gonna be a, become a civil servant, then do uh, go to usajobs.gov and you have all, pretty much all the uh, agencies there. Sometimes they redirect you to their uh, pages, but that's where you go. And for the contractor, go to the official career pages. Uh, that's where you actually find the jobs. Um, all right, so for the military, I'm only gonna focus on, on two because that's where I'm the most familiar. Um, the Army and the Air Force. So the, like I mentioned earlier, the Army, because at one point they were Cyber Command, um, they were able, they were running the short for Cyber. But then they, the NSA took over. So now it has its own component. So it's, it's called Cybercom. And the NSA, it's the big boss. But all the branches are working together and they coming up with this position. So if you actually look at the position, the 17C for the Army and the one Bravo 4 for the Air Force, the requirements are the same. Um, I'm actually just gonna go over here and here is a career page for it. You have, um, so those are some of the duties. But again, when you go into the training, look at all the certifications you're gonna get once you complete this, you know, this job, right? They will pay for it. So that's, without just talking about how much you're gonna get paid, but how much in training they're gonna give to you because you're attending this, right? 
uh, with the one Bravo four, almost kind of like the same thing. Um, uh, they don't have a list kind of like in the army, they give you just more of the requirements, but they will give you uh, a good information on what the job entitles you. Now, one thing I will, I will say, and this is where I was like, wow, chances are that I, I might go back to the army. It was because of the direct commissioning program. Back in the day, direct commissioning was for lawyers, um, chaplains, um, medics, doctors. They have a direct commissioning program where they don't have to go through the whole training and start from scratch. Well, this year, actually last year, they implemented with active duty. So now if you have a four year degree and have experience in cybersecurity, they make you first lieutenant, which is like a second grade after um, you know, uh, the bottom of the officer rank. Uh, if the, the more certifications and the more experience you have, they can make you a captain or a major right away, which I think that was awesome. Before we didn't have that. The big change this year. A year ago, it was only for active duty. For this year, it was reserve and guard. So now you don't have to work for the army and, and, and work full time making less money. You can actually be a, a weekend warrior making okay money, but then making more money in the outside of your regular job. So I think this is the push uh, from the army. I think they make a really good decision making these changes. Now, same thing with the, uh, the requirements, the physical standards are lower. The, um, even the fitness program they have, you know, they, they're not, they realize that they cannot keep having people turning down people because they cannot run certain amount of miles in certain minutes or hours, whatever, or pull ups and all that stuff. So now they actually created this program for people inside. And, and come on, let's, let's be realistic, especially in this area. We don't see people in tech very like, you know, GI Joe. GI Joe. It's not exactly. Like GI Joe. Yeah. exactly. So we don't see that in here. So I think the army did a really good um, move by doing that. And I'll share the, uh, the site. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna share these slides. So uh, whatever you cannot get right now, you will, um, you'll be able to get them later. So here is a lot of information on how to get it. The process is different. You don't have to go through the uh, reg regular recruiting office. You actually go through a VIP recruiting office sitting in the East Coast uh, from the Pentagon and the NSA and all that. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, and actually it says right here, uh, those are the people that are, they're looking for, DevOps engineers, uh, security engineers, um, vulnerability researchers, you name it. Um, I think that's pretty cool. If you feel like you want to serve your country and feel very patriotic, hey, you know what? I'm a cyber never analyst. Huh? Instead, I'm a cyber analyst. Yeah. You know, instead of like, oh, I'm Cisco this or I'm that, you know, it's like war games. You find a bunch of students, you know, group A, group B, yeah. you play them against each other in virtual like, possibilities. Yeah. And then you find out, oh, what if we hit by a nuke or we hit by this? And, yeah. then, and someone says, oh, we didn't plan for this. Well, I guess you didn't run your scenarios very well. Because yeah. <laughs> I hear analysts all the time, you know, like, uh, you know, certain shows. It's like, you know, yeah. uh, famous guy, Jack Bauer. 24, you know, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, he's oh, CTU, Cyber Terrorism Unit. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, this is gonna happen and we're ready, and this is not gonna happen, we're not ready. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, again, the, uh, the way of how they're training uh, the new troops, are, uh, cyber troops, it, it's, it's changing. So definitely, you will see. And because like, you, you figure for all these general scenarios, but you don't figure for outside scenarios. Right. I guess that's what I'm not hearing, I guess. Okay. Yeah, like, you know, I hear the term analyst, I'm thinking, well, how much do you need for that, you know? Well, it's the same thing as in the private thing. sector. Um, my title, if you, you look that title in another company, mm -hmm. totally different. So don't, don't go by the name. I will suggest this is just a generic uh, advice. When you're looking for a job, don't, don't just type analyst or engineer and, mm -hmm. and thinking that it's gonna be like a high, level position because every every company will provide their own job descriptions. And an analyst in one company could be a, 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 a security engineer in another company. So don't, don't just get it by the name. Because, 
Well, I'm an employment specialist here mm -hmm. at school and working with students in computer science and IT departments. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a huge veterans program and quite a few students doing mm -hmm. computer science. It's not even here in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Will they send out, uh, will the cybersecurity recruiters come out to the college and talk to veterans? You know, you've ever, ever heard of them? Because I don't think most veterans know about these programs. In the, PC, in the PC area, they do. They do? So, help, I'll talk about health and human services and what it was, but we did job fairs in the DC area, because that's where I was. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends. You know, I, my sense, and I can talk about this in a bit, is that we're going to see a big change in about a year or so after the election. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big movement to really boost cyber security and cybersecurity um, across all the sectors. And I think, you know, some of this is the groundwork, and we're definitely going in that direction during the Obama administration. And I expect that's going to see a lot of resources in the next two years, especially. So I think it's coming. There is um, cybersecurity programs at the University of Maryland at um, uh, Baltimore Penn, the OBC is going to be there's, there's different schools that have, that, that have programs that specifically with the CIA, and with the NSA that really will just sort of like ask the appointment on. So there, I think we're gonna, and you're seeing some of this in foundation for what's coming because I think we, we just have to look just around the world, like we're definitely becoming a cyber war sort of, um, you know, program. I think that's, we will see a lot more of this. And, and believe it or not, uh, if you actually read on the direct program that they have now, again, this is so new, the, the implementation was just a few months ago. I, I didn't even know about it. A year ago, when I actually went through the whole process of going back to the military for the one round of war, and I, I didn't mention it, but the whole reason I didn't end up not going is because uh, the Air Force didn't make a change. So I was able to pass the, the, the physical, uh, the ASVAB, everything, but there was one test that I didn't pass, and it was a requirement, and it was an IQ test from the 1970s. And, and because I, I, I was already doing the work, I was already having the certifications went through all the uh, interviews, and because I didn't have the score that they wanted, um, I was done for them. That, that's what the reality was. And that's why they told me, if you don't have the score, we cannot accept you. I said, well, thank you so much for your time. Then I'm not There's no going back. Board, right? Yeah. It's not saying, oh, I challenge this, and you're not up to date. You know? Right, exactly. So, I mean, bad for them, because I actually, they, they were hurting on ga gaming people, and I was meeting all the requirements because of but the only one I didn't. And I still didn't take me. I was like, okay, well, one day you'll figure it out. Well, the army actually took advantage of that and, and created a, something whole new that we haven't seen that in years, making a whole direct uh, commissioning program for people in cyber. I know it was coming. I wish the, actually the Air Force was one of the ones, not the army, but hey, good for the army because they're, I hear a lot of good things about it, so, um, so yeah. All right, so for civil servants, uh, again, go to USA, usajobs.gov and look at the, uh, uh, what they have around. So I'm just gonna demo really quickly, um, you know, how's the, uh, the website. So here you can type, uh, if you type InfoSec or something along the line, you will see a lot of jobs. Um, see, there is 938 jobs throughout the US. Now you wanna make it more specific, then you can type San Francisco, for example. And then you can start seeing, well, there's 34 positions that you can currently work for the government um, in, in this area. Um, so Department of Air and Affairs, Department of Energy, um, and kind of like what uh, uh, Laura is saying, uh, uh, there were a lot of changes, and I guess a lot of the reasons why the um, uh, people left the jobs is because of the new president. And once we have a new president, or if we don't have a new president, whatever the case is, you, you will still see the, the changes, right? You you're gonna see a changes regardless, but this is how you, you do it. Um, also, one of the conversations we have is now the process to get 
to work for the government in these positions, actually it's not as, as bad as it used to be. I remember when I used to fill out these type of applications, there were thousands and thousands of questions they were ask, asking me. And, and you know, at the, by the time I finished the, uh, the questionnaire, I was like, you know what? I don't really want to work for the government. <laughs> it, it, it was just too much, you know. It, they want too much. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was it was it was tiring. Uh, but now it's more of a direct hire. If you have the qualifications, if you have, regardless if you have a, a clearance or not, or you're able to get it, um, you have certifications and you have a degree. Uh, you know what? You might be a, a good in a good position to, to get a job for the government. So. Um, here uh contractors i'm actually going to show you this one in specific because this is what i was talking about you must have a you must be a uh unicorn in order to get uh um you know hired uh active eod secret clearance uh the secret plan must be basically the way i understand that you have to be five years uh still active for five more years in order to take it. You must have uh, knowledge on all these systems um, and have, uh, be able to get the security plus certifications within 90 days. Otherwise, they'll put you off. And, you know, not, not everybody is good on taking tests. I wasn't. So I, that's why I don't have like a lot of certifications compared to other people who have like a wall of certifications. But that's the way they, you have a question. What specific is this? This is for uh, actually an information systems analyst in the Sunnyvale office here in, uh, for Lockheed Martin. Okay, that, so it's not military. But no, this military. is a contractor. This, uh, this is a Third party. public available, anybody can apply. Well, obviously, as you can see, it's not for everybody. You will not get a DOD clearance unless you have worked previously with the government. And how you do that, either work from uh, Government contract or government employee or military. So that right there disqualifies everybody but here, I think. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> much I have Oh, here you go. So she's not even qualified. So we probably, regardless of how much knowledge we have, we're already disqualified because of the first point in here. Um, and also, okay, I have the clearance. I go and apply. How much is the position? Yeah, it's not gonna be as good as whatever uh, Google or Facebook or these other companies are paying their employees for the same type of title. Now we're going by job responsibility by job responsibility, not title, just the duties itself. And you start comparing those like, wait, that guy's from making 180 plus or something, and you're only paying me 120, 30. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. So. Um, it's not like the guy that qualifies can train you to go in, you know, I think that's what's wrong with it. They want the guy that is qualified, but they don't consider the guy that's qualified to be having him train his subordinates. So kind of like a recap, um, definitely uh, the, the government in general, good place to start and end your career. If you are very patriotic and decide to do a military career, um, you can start early and you can end early. I'll give you an example. My previous boss at NASA, he went to the military when he was 17. He did 20 years in the Navy. After 20 years, he was 37. Uh, he started, uh, because you retire from the active duty military, you start earning whatever you were making, only like three fourths of what you were making. And you will get that until the day you die. The day, the week after he retired, he basically started working in the same shop, same place, same everything, but as a contractor, making three times or four times of what he was making as a, uh, as a military member. But now he was receiving two checks, one from his military retirement and one from his government contractor. So if you put it in perspective, it's like, wait, so he actually finished one career and he started another one. Now he can start contributing to 401k or whatever retirement program they have. But hey, you know what? It's an option. Uh, my wife, that's exactly what she's doing. Um, she's going to do her 20. And 
uh, she's gonna start a new career doing something else. More likely, and from what I understand, she wants to continue working for the government. Hey, nothing wrong about it. In my case, it didn't really work out because the money wasn't there, the, uh, the opportunities were not there at the time. Actually, um, when I left the military, that's when they start coming up with all these new, with new things. And I was like, I wish those opportunities were when I, I was in. And that's basically the whole reason I, was, I left, because the opportunities were not there. Um, eventually, I tried to come back, but then I started yeah. to continue facing all those uh, barriers. I was like, you know what? I'll just continue in the private sector. Again, with the Army opening to these new programs, I'm like, I might consider it. That's why I haven't closed my, 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 my doors to the military or continue working for the government because uh, I think there is a lot of room for opportunity, but it's gonna take time to make those changes. And, but it, they're happening and that's a good thing, it's happening. Um, so good place to start in your career, lots of opportunities, great benefits, job security. Regardless of the government shutdowns, there is job security because at least you know that the government, government needs you. And that's where uh, you're definitely gonna have job security. Private sector, depending how the market is, depending if, let's say you're working for a product company and the product didn't sell or whatever, the repair of the product, boom, they, they short the staff by you know, the teams and stuff like that, and then you're out. Now you, you have to face, uh, you have to go and find another job. Uh, so that happens a lot in this area. Uh, great way to get experience. Uh, I think again, being in the military, you gain a lot of good things. Uh, same thing with the uh, uh, government. One thing I will say that um, you learn in the military is how to deal with bullshit. I, I will be honest, <laughs> that is true. In, in the private sector, um, every, everybody's so sensitive. In the military, you're like, people are throwing stuff at you like fire, and you just learn, you live with it. So by the time your boss comes and tells you all this stuff, it's like, okay, sure, I'll do it. Where other coworkers who don't have the military experience, they, they'll be like, Growing around like all stressed out and this and that, like you just, just chill out, you know. It's gonna get there when it's gonna get there. So, um, so yeah. So uh, one of the cons, not some mentality, and that's because it's very political. Lots of BS, like I mentioned. So um, one of the bad things about working for the government is they have a checklist. You fill out the checklist, good. You want to make an improvement, you cannot. So. That was it. So, any questions, regardless of uh, besides what I, I we just discussed? Anything? Anyone? Anyone want to make a comment? Questions, comments? Um, the next thing I will say is uh, we have a cybersecurity conference coming up in November, eight, nine, and ten. Um, it's called phack.org, and Sam is actually going to be going to be one of our speakers. I'll show you the website really quickly. Um, so the actual um, eight is training days, but the nine and ten are the actual uh, talks. And if you go to the um, a schedule, and like for example, on Sunday, uh, Sam is going to be give a presentation on cyber responsibility. Uh, but day one is actually busier, and you'll have people from different industries. Um, uh, these, these people, for example, are coming from DC to give the presentation. Uh, there's other um, uh, workshops. So we're going to do a lot of workshops. So if you are in, in security right now, uh, like for example, uh, the SCADI, I don't know if you ever heard of SCADI. Uh, the, the, the creator of the tool is going to actually come and, and give a presentation on this. So definitely a good place to meet people and if you don't have a job, if you want to find a job, that's definitely the place to go. Um, so an invitation there. And with that being said, 
thank you so much for having me here. I uh, really appreciate it. And for the ones online, um, I think they have a question, maybe? Since it's uh, very informative, Marco, your talk brought back memories of the Army, good and bad. Sorry, right. awesome. <laughs> it always it is like that. So with that, now I'm going to introduce Laura. Uh, and it is my honor to introduce her because I actually feel very lucky to have her as my neighbor, but also she, she's my friend and definitely a lot to learn from her. So stick around and you'll learn a lot more than what I just provided. So Laura, <laughs> here's the other clicker. Okay, great, thank you. Just save any video or no video? Start this forward? No, 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 the middle one. The middle one, yeah. All right, cool. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy to be here for you tonight. Um, okay. okay, so that was my disclaimer. All of you, all of you are my own. Um, don't hold me accountable. So, about me, um, I actually started out at a community college as well. I went to Nassau Community College in Long Island, New York, and then transferred to the State University of New York at Dayton. And then my husband and dropped out of college because he told me to, and um, told me to read great books, which I did for about a year and a half. I read all the classics and worked um, doing payroll. And then I transferred to the University of Pittsburgh um, as an in-state student in Pennsylvania. Uh, we got married, we moved back to New York, had three kids, and um, one of our children was disabled. And um, I had a lot of really terrible experiences with the healthcare system, and so, um, I decided I wanted to go change the healthcare system. So that's what I did. So I uh, moved back to Pittsburgh and went to Pitt Law and did a JD, MPH combined degree at Pitt. Had two more kids, had one in my second year of law school and another one about six months after I graduated. So we have five. Um, and my first job was as a compliance manager back at um, Hudson River Healthcare. And, um, so it's a federally qualified health center, which is a federally funded health center that is a nonprofit. It gets a lot of uh, funding from the, from the federal government. And then because of that, whenever the federal government gives you any money, they have lots and lots of rules. And so um, my job is to make sure we were compliant with all the federal and state regulations. It was the best job ever. And one of the things I learned about sort of this experience, which I tell everyone, including my kids, is your first job, don't worry about the money worry about what you're going to learn and who you're going to be. And that job was like the biggest deep dive into healthcare. And I learned so much that I never knew about it from law school or my public health degree. I learned about the 340B drug program, which allows certain entities to buy prescription drugs at a deep discount, 30 to 40% off if you're going to provide it to people of low income or no income. I learned about the migrant healthcare system. I learned about how to file for, um, for regulations with the New York State in order to even create a new site. I learned so much stuff just from the two years I was there. Now, my next job was a director of compliance and privacy for a three hospital system, where I learned a ton of stuff there too. But then I got recruited by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which was an awesome opportunity. And it was just at the beginning of electronic health records, um, which were just beginning at that time. We, my health center had been a really early adopter, so I'd seen some very early um, adoption of that. But the New York City job was um, when Bloomberg was mayor, and Bloomberg's a big data guy, if anyone knows anything about him. Um, he made all his money from providing data in the stock market. And so when our, our, my boss, who later became the national coordinator for health IT, went to him and said, we want to do this thing with data and providing data within healthcare, he was super excited. And so the primary care information project became the largest community implementation of electronic health records in the country and consequently became the model for the regional extension center program and so i ended up going to dc when my bosses were, were uh, recruited by the obama administration that was just starting so it all kind of came in, in this amazing way and i spent seven years in the federal government I'm now the Chief Compliance Officer for the County of Santa Clara Health System, which in itself is a huge health system. Um, I think it's the second largest in California after LA. And we have um, about three hospitals, a very large behavioral health center uh, aspect of it, which is sort of inpatient, outpatient. Um, we have a public health department, custody health, a very large jail system. 
So it's very, very large and very complex, lots of different things happening, lots of technology. I'll talk a lot about that, but that's just sort of my path. And I think my take home message is say yes to things, say yes to challenges, to learning new things. I have learned continuously. When I started out, I didn't even know what an electronic health record was. I remember it was like, what is this even about? And I, I just, I've learned so much and we'll talk about that. So a lot of it is about, um, being open to new opportunities. We talked a little bit about federal agencies. Um, there's also the FDA. So with the US Health, um, Department of Health and Human Services is a very large agency. Um, I think it's second or third after DOD. And it includes all of this alphabets do, a lot of which is household names, FDA, CDC, CMS, which is Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, pays for virtually everyone's healthcare who's over 65 plus the, um, disabled folks. National Institute of Health, uh, promotes and pays for a huge amount of research. Uh, Agency for Health Research and Quality does a lot of evaluation work. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, I spent about two years there as well. Um, HRSA um, does a lot of funding for the health centers, also Indian uh, Health Services. ASPR does all the preparedness and response. If you remember back when um, the children were being separated from their parents at the border, ASPR was the agency in HHS charged with trying to put them back together. After, after they were sundered by the, by the Border Patrol. So they do all of the responsive parents. A lot of cybersecurity happens at ASPR. And ASPR does a lot of evaluation work. Um, our program's working, and that's just some of it. That's not even all of the operating divisions. In the office of the secretary is Office for Civil Rights. Now the Office for Civil Rights has a civil rights part where they will um, investigate and potentially find uh, programs that are discriminatory based on race, ethnicity, gender. But the other side of the house at OCR is actually privacy and security with a pretty big cybersecurity piece to ensure that all of the entities that are funded and are um, both funded under CMS that receive federal funding or hospitals, any of the covered entities under HIPAA, which are hospitals, pharmacies, laboratories, you know, anyone you can think of that's providing care in some way, they all come under HIPAA. And so HIPAA has both a privacy and a security role. And they've got a pretty big security division where they need security people. Does HIPAA cover um, a pharmaceutical yes. marketing agency? Yes. Marketing. Yes, so there's actually a prohibition on selling PHI for marketing. So there is, and we'll talk about this, there's covered entities under HIPAA, and then there's the business associates. And we'll talk about the difference on that and where that, why that's important. But keep an eye on OCR. Um, HHS has a lot of security stuff going on, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The other big office at the Office of Secretary related to Security is the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, which also works really closely with OCR. But um, they're the folks who basically funded all of the EHR adoption. If you've gone to the doctor in the hospital in the last five years, you'll have noticed that everything now is electronic, everything is on computer. That's why, because during the Obama administration, when the stimulus bill was passed, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, part of that was high tech, which was a huge amount of money to begin to bring the health system information system into the electronic environment. So it was a big catch up on that. Um, and that needs a tremendous amount of work, and that's a really important sector. Other parts of Office of the Secretary are ASPR, a, a, um, the administration piece, OWASH, which does policy, and ASL, which does a lot of work um, at liaisoning with Congress. And you can go to the link and see all of that. Other federal agencies, VA is a big one. Uh, Marco talked about the VA in Palo Alto. There's both the Veterans Administration that deals with benefits, there's the Veterans Health Administration, which runs the hospitals. They've had a lot of issues. They've had, they've had a debacle of an electronic health record implementation that has gone on for years. They just did another RFP about two years ago. They're still working through all of that. Definitely there's a need for, for cybersecurity and security folks um, at the VA. They're, all of those, they have their own legacy EHR, but they're trying to get onto something that's more up to date. Office of Management and Budget, it's a big agency as well. USDA has a lot of cyber, I've got some friends over there. Um, Department of Justice, EPA, um, Department of State, et cetera, et cetera. The government's huge, 2.1 million civilians work for the federal government. 
1.4 million in our um, additional military, a budget of about $4 trillion, and 79% of the federal workforce works outside of the DC metro area. So there is probably a federal government office near you. There's a big HHS office that's regional for, um, in San Francisco, actually. You hear about the scandal for the pharmacy technician? The test got out. Yeah, so there's lots of that happens all the time. Right, so the, this is the GS schedule for, um, this is the San Francisco one, there's a locality pay differential depending on where you live. So I pulled up the, um, the San, I have the, both the San Jose, San Francisco one, I also have on the next slide the, um, the Washington DC one. I have not seen postings for grades one, two, or three in a very long time. They usually start around grade, about, uh, grade four, GS4, and go up to GS15. And as you can see, they all top out at 166,500. That's as most as you can make generally, unless you have something else. Like I've seen doctors make a lot more than that. Um, there's a few other classes that can make more, but generally GS15 is, is, is where it, it stops and it's, it's 166,500. Um, there's obviously been a cap on how much you can, they've, they've been increasing that. I expect that's probably going to change. There's a lot of retirements coming out of the federal government. I think this will probably look different, although we do have this massive deficit, thanks to the 2017 tax act. So this is, um, this gives you a sense of what it would be. Uh, after GS-15 is what they call the senior executive service. And then that, but that again, it doesn't really go up much, too much in pay. There are some differentials depending on if you have an MD. MDs get paid significantly more. Um, but the, and then this is Washington DC. Again, it tops out at 166, but the salaries are a little bit lower as you see across the board. The way the steps work is you get, so they hire you as a 12, let's say, which pays, step one is 83,000. You'll get step, the next year you'll get step two, which is 86. The next year you'll get step three, which is 88.9, it's almost 90,000. It'll now be two years before you get your next step raise, which is 91, and then another two years, 94, and another two years, 97. Then you'll be in step seven, or I think it's another two years for that. And then for the next three steps, you have to wait three years. So that seems like a long time, however, you will still get the increase every year. There's usually a cost of living increase that runs between one to 3%, sometimes more depending on what happens with inflation. So in addition to these step increases, you can also see another two to 3% a year. So it actually gets to be pretty, it's not bad. I mean, it's steady increases in your salary, which you, know, you don't always see in the private sector. So just keep that in mind. DC is a little cheaper than San Francisco. Um, so it's a little bit less, but to Marco's point, it's not as good as the private sector. Getting hired again, usjobs.gov. Um, it's run by the Office of Personnel Management. They themselves had a massive hack about two years ago by the Chinese. My information was taken, as was my spouse, um, because when you have to, um, when you become a federal employee, you have to give them all this information, which brings me to a great story. So. When I, when I first became a Fed, you, know, you get hired, and then they come and do your security clearance. And so you have to have an interview. So you have to fill out all this paperwork, and then you have to, they have to send, you have to give them references of people who you know, who are like your neighbors and your friends, you know, who will then vouch for you, and they've got to fill out questionnaires. So now that they've done all that, now I'm sitting down um, in the meeting with the investigator, and she says, well, tell me about, your husband being born in Afghanistan. And I'm like, he wasn't born in Afghanistan, he was born in Denver. And she's like, no, you wrote down Afghanistan. And she shows me this because Afghanistan was the first country that shows up on, on the drop down list. No! So it was an A, so they don't default to the US. I'm like, no, he was actually born in Denver, Colorado. But I was like, <laughs> but at the same time, there's this weird thing in the government where like, who do you know who's a foreigner? And I'm like, I'm from New York. Everyone I know is a foreigner. Are you kidding me? I mean, like my father-in-law is from Colombia. Half my friends are from other countries. I mean, like, it's very strange, but that's the, I'm hoping that changes because it seems so odd. If you're like on the East or West Coast, that's a very strange way to look at the world. But they will ask you, who do you know who's a foreigner? It's very bizarre. But anyway, it's part of that clearance process. 
I, I'd love to see that in the context of what's happening today, but that's okay. Yes. Will they interview your neighbors? Yes, they will interview. It depends on your level of security. So there's, there's all these different levels of clearances, and it depends on what your job is. So they will interview your neighbors, especially as you get to the higher level of clearance. They really start to dig into your background, your financial, they'll pull your whole financial report. They get, they, even for like my, my clearance, and I was like not doing anything that was they went to grade school, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of nuts, and it gets worse and worse, it's like more intrusive as you go. But yes, they will, they, they will actually go to your neighbors and all kinds of things. And they'll, you have to sign your, your, their, your, their permission for them to do that when you can't be hired. So it is a bit like you're not free. That is definitely part of, it's a trade-off, right? Like anything else in life. I live in my Facebook friends, you know, my neighbor, my next door neighbor. Yeah. They don't come out, they will open their door. Yeah, no, I mean, and they, and if they can't get them, they can't get them. I don't think they really, it doesn't make, but they you have to have some people who can vouch for who you are and, and provide that background. It doesn't have to be your neighbor. Um, and if, the, I mean, everybody has that. I think today, especially, that's more common, but it depends. I mean, they, they will definitely want to talk to people who know you, so. And I think the higher you go, the more intrusive it does get. When you set up the USAjobs.gov account, you can set alerts. Um, I have a lot of experience with doing this. So, um, you the alerts are great, but you still have to do a manual check because the alerts have a lag of about 12 hours, I think. And the government has started doing this thing where they want the, the first 100 applications because it, and so that's been a thing I've been watching happen. Like they will only look at the first 100 applications. So be aware of that. So it's really important. Like your alerts are great, but you still need to do a run. If you're like actively looking, run a, run a manual check every day. I don't think so. I don't think they have an app. If it's all online, you have to just go online and yeah. They have a, they have an app that USA Jobs has an app now. They didn't used to. They didn't used to. It went. It was bad. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Version 1.0. Yeah, no, I'm sure it was bad. Okay, so um, what's it like to be a Fed? So there's two different ways you can work as a Fed. You can be internally focused on your agency, where like you're at the USDA, like a friend of mine is, and you're securing the USDA's networks, and you're looking internally at what's happening at the USDA, or you're looking at HHS and all of the data HHS has, which is huge, right? Um, SAMHSA in particular gets a huge amount of identifiable data. So they've got, how are you securing that? What are the policies around securing that? Um, what are the procedures? And then there are people who just work on architecture. What is your architecture? What are the contracts? How are you going to make sure that you can get everybody brand new laptops and brand new servers? Um, and then there's the old, other piece of it, which is that under um, the law, any time the government's going to collect information on on the people who live in the government, in the country rather, they have to do a systems of record notice. This is an actual description of what you're collecting, how it's being used, how long it will be kept, what, and what are the, what's the reason for it. And that has to get published in the federal register. So that actually, so you may have missed it. This is why there was an article last week that the government was going to start collecting DNA samples of everyone who appeared at the border. And the reason why is because the media picked up on it because they saw it show up in the Federal Register. And when things come up in the Federal Register, you have the right to comment on it. We had a system of record notice because we had every single provider, every single physician in the U.S. and what electronic health record they adopted and whether they achieved meaningful use. So I actually ran that system and had a system of record notice for it. So that's where, it, and so that has to all be public. You have to tell the public that you're doing this. So there was nothing that was um, confidential in that record. All that stuff was publicly available information, but you still had to have that. So that's a system of record notice. And you, it's up, someone working on the cybersecurity side would, would be working on things like that. Other things, monitoring networks, ensuring redundancy, making sure that everything's backed up. And in a lot of contract management, um, there's a, a role in the government called a contractor's officer's representative, which sounds so archaic, like what is that? Basically, you're the person running the contract. So there'll be a massive contract, let's say with the army. This is really common. We'd have military DOD contracts and we would be able to write like a task on that contract. 
and then in order you have a contractor's officer like a, a military officer overseeing a military contract but then the core and there's different levels of core would be overseeing that contract's task which could be pretty big in multi-million dollars and then they would be the person who's also often the subject matter expert not always but often um, some of these are DOD contracts and also HHS can put out its own contracts. So a lot of contracting on both the internally focused and also the externally focused, which was generally how I operated. So, um, for example, I provided a huge amount of expertise and, and technical assistance to stakeholders. And then in our case, our, our stakeholders were physicians, nurses, office personnel, staff, who are adopting electronic health records. We had um, $600 million that went out for this program just to provide the assistance so that these people could adopt electronic health records securely and still safeguard patients' information and still use the CHR to support improved care. So I ran a community of practice of 83 people from all over the, all over the United States on providing expertise on how to comply with the HIPAA privacy and security rules. I was also, and that was on top of being a program officer for the first year where I oversaw $100 million myself for New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, DC, uh, and Maryland and Delaware. I was conflicted out of New York because I already came from the New York City project, so I couldn't do that project, but I had the rest of them. For the East Coast. And I also traveled all over the country um, because we had all sorts of meetings all over the country trying to provide that technical assistance. Um, I created a lot of training materials and tools. Um, so here's my positions at HHS, and I'll show you some of the things I created. My first year I was a program officer at OMC. I eventually became a senior advisor to the chief privacy officer at OMC. She also was an advisor directly to the secretary of HHS, um, who was Sibelius was the secretary. And then we had um, an, another person come out after Sibelius left. I then became the health IT lead at SAMHSA, where I oversaw a $30 million contract at SAMHSA just for health IT, just to create cool stuff for people who were struggling with substance abuse and, and mental health issues. And so we've worked with all of the operating divisions within SAMHSA, which is mental health, uh, substance abuse, substance abuse prevention. Uh, because we have all these divisions, and as well as CBIS, which is their center for uh, behavioral health statistics. And all of the work that they wanted to do to leverage health IT, we, I, that was my team. I had seven people on my team. No, I guess it was nine. And on top of all of that, we also rewrote 42 CFR part two in 2014, where it was released in the 2017 final rule, which allowed for the sharing of substance abuse treatment information more electronically to support uh, people's care. And we updated the rule so that it, it made sense in an electronic environment to the extent that we could. And then I became, I left SAMHSA and became a GS-15. Um, I would not have left SAMHSA. I love that job so much. It was such a phenomenal job. I could do so many cool things, and it, we had money and a budget. How many and years the people, it was about two years. But then they lured me away back to ONC with a GS 15, and you don't say no to a GS 15. So I left and went back to do health IT adoption and interoperability. So here's some of the things I did um, when I was at ONC we created video games. <laughs> for providers and hospitals that have actually been used all over the country to teach people like how to work with an electronic farm. I mean, these physicians were going from paper to having all of their patient records electronically on, on an EHR. And so there's all sorts of things I didn't know. You can still go to these, there's the, there's the link, and you can see the games. There's one on um, just general security, and, and then there's another one on redundancy and how to back data up and making sure, like what the provisions are in the security rule for backing up data. That one's my favorite. We weren't able to be as clever with the script. I had to write all this. I basically wrote this. And then we worked with the contractor to actually develop, you pick up the avatars. The avatars have to be like diverse. It's very fun. They got their clothes. It was a really very cool project. The contingency one, if you get the answer wrong, the offices flood. 
and then there's also lightning and stuff. It's very fun. Um, so that's we did two games, and then the other really important project, which has been downloaded all over the world, is the security risk assessment. Um, part of when we when we all this money was put out to uh, adopt electronic health records, about twenty billion dollars went to providers themselves to pay for the licenses and what the cost was. In order to get that money, they had to meet um, these meaningful use measures. Part of the measure was that under the HIPAA security rule, you have to do a risk assessment. And they had no idea how to do a risk assessment. And that became a big issue. Like, what do I do with a risk assessment? You have a small practice in Iowa. How do you do a risk assessment? So we actually created an online tool that is free that um, was an enormous amount of work. We worked very closely with both Office of Civil Rights and Office of General Counsel to create this tool. You can also see this, it's still online. Um, it was just upgraded again about last year. And it actually walks a provider a small hospital, because um, we have these uh, uh, critical access hospitals around the country, to actually do a security risk assessment based on NIST 853. So very cool project. Um, I got to travel all over the country and really tout that and get people to use it. So those are the kind of cool things you can do in the government. Um, developing policy, I know there's some interest in that. Developing policy based in, when you're talking about national policy, is based on the Administrative Procedure Act which governs how federal agencies create law. And it requires that agencies create a notice of proposed rulemaking. You should all be watching these very carefully. I know not everybody watches the Federal Register. A lot of stuff is happening with the NPRMs, both with the environment and with a lot of other things. When an NPRM is posted, you have 60 days to comment and anyone can comment. And it's not hard to comment, you just go to regulations.gov. You can actually see everybody else's comments too. Usually that comment period is 60 days. And then when the final rule is drafted, the final rule has to address all the comments. How do they do that? You get thousands and thousands of comments. They bucket them. So these are all about this one issue, and then these are all about these other issues. And then when the final rule is written, there'll be a preamble in the beginning. It'll say, we received 40, 724 comments on this issue. We heard these things. We decided to do this. And all of that has to be done. Like, you have to address all the comments and provide the rationale as to why they were included or rejected. So this is how policy is done. Um, you will read a lot of rules and comment on a lot of rules. I read almost all of the Affordable Care Act rules. I read the, the, almost all of the ACO rules, which was the Accountable Care Organizations. Um, I read the HIPAA High Tech rules when it was updated in 2013. Like, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of reading, and a lot of commenting. But you're only looking for one thing. If you're doing privacy and security, you're only looking at the rule for that. You're not looking at it for, and there are eight, 900 pages. You're just looking for your piece of it. But that is a big part of policy making in DC. So how long is it before the uh, records are uh, up to date for like uh, the ransomware? So like you have backups, and then you can back up the virus a lot with the regular backups. Right, yeah, and that's an issue, right? And so <laughs> this years. provides you with like the framework, but then you need people like all of you who read that and say, okay, now what's, the next step because the government can't write regulations that take everything into account. It needs to give you a framework and then it's up to professionals to figure out how, how is the technology moving in that direction. We, Mark and I were talking on the way in about quantum computing and the impact on quantum computing on encryption and whether we even will have encryption because of quantum computing. So th that's where like we probably need something new, right? And that's where people need to say, okay, Encryption did that, but now we need something different, or encryption needs to be different. Um, so that's where people are needed. So the good, because I want to wrap up, because I know I'm taking a lot of your time. Oh, this is um, fun. The, the good part is you can make a difference, sometimes in really big ways. And this is an example of where like, I'm, what I'm really proud of. You know, when I was dealing with a lot of issues in healthcare, I saw such a mess with just like the information and people. I've even seen doctors' hearts getting doctored. So there was like, this was amazing to see, this is the adoption rate in electronic health records from 2009 to 2014. And what, how fast that was because of the work that the Office of the National, National Coordinator was doing and CMS and how we were partnering to create a, an ability to adopt these records securely. Here's an adoption of EHR position offices. Um, this was the hardest to do because hospitals have the bandwidth and the infrastructure to do things um, and, and take on big projects, but physician offices do not. 
And this is how fast we had adoption. We went from about 15% in 2007 to about 85, 80% today. So that's kind of amazing. Um, and here's some of the articles I, that I actually appeared in because of these projects. For Consent to Share was a big SAMHSA project. Um, and we were actually able to create software that allowed a patient to decide how they wanted their information to be shared and whether they wanted their substance abuse information, but maybe not at their STD history. We actually were able to like, develop that. And that's actually open source. And I'm seeing a demo tomorrow as the latest version because we're trying to put it together for a project we're doing. Um, so I have, this is like the cool thing you can do if you were in the right place in the right time in the government. The bad. I felt like this almost every day. I mean, just banging your head against the wall, in this case, throwing it against the wall. Um, it can, as Marco was saying, it can be really frustrating. Um, it's a bureaucracy, it's big, it's a lot of people. And that's probably the hardest part. I'm an impatient person. I want everything done yesterday. It's hard to work in large organizations, so that's not gonna happen. Oh, the other thing is, head in the, sand. That'd, that'd be yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, like, I don't know how things will go in the future. We've had just had the longest shutdown. Um, we've got a CR until November. I don't know if we'll have another shutdown. What will happen? We have a really enormous federal budget deficit. So I don't know what the impact will be of these things, but there's something to keep in mind. Um, you'll learn a lot in the federal government, and it's similar to what Marco was saying about the military. Um, you'll learn how the federal government actually works. It's so complicated, it takes them two years. So after two years, I was like, I think I get it. And I was there for seven years. The value of soft power, that's a really important. How to move things when you have nothing to move it with but relationships. And I learned how to develop relationships with people and get things done because, you know, I just knew them and I, I was able to like move projects based on that. Um, Keep learning because nothing ever stays the same, especially in technology and especially in healthcare. Um, democracy is messy, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, and it's frustrating, but it's worth it. And it needs to be safeguarded. Democracies all around the world are under threat. And if we don't protect our democracy, we will lose it. And you, when you work for the government, you have an opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourselves. And that's a great honor. And it's also like a worthwhile investment of your time. So always keep that in mind. And at the end of the day, your country needs you and you probably need your country. So it's important to think about that. And you can do a lot of good, but it will require patience. Um, it can be really engaging and thrilling and fun. Big parts of it that make it fun are where are you? Is your agency have money? Uh, because that's a big piece of it. When ONC was awesome, when it had a ton of money, and then we spent all the money, right? We did our project. We actually, as you can see from the graphs, we achieved our mission. We got electronic health records adopted. We created standards for electronic health records. We created standards for how people should use them. Success, well, the money isn't there anymore. So it's different now. SAMHSA has a lot of money because of the opiate crisis. When you're in an agency that has money and is funded, you can do really cool things. So that's important. So does your agency have a mission? And is the mission timely? Is it unique and it's needed and it's important and also a key interest or initiative of the administration? That was where I really lucked out. I was always able to be at the, at the government when it was that key thing the government wanted. And I think what will happen in the next year or two is the key thing will be cybersecurity. We can see like how much under siege we all are on this and it's both on cyber warfare and on, on protecting our assets. Like that is going to be the key thing. It's already talk about beginning to develop a privacy data group in the government and really start in privacy regu uh, um, regulations are coming. And the thing is that without security, you don't have privacy. So the two go hand in glove. And I think there's going to be a big push on this because we've seen what happens when we don't have privacy. We just saw what happened in 2016, and we're seeing it happen again. So um, that's one of the most important things. Be somewhere where you are needed. Um, those, that's where you want to be in the government. And I think that's it. Any questions? What about stateside adoption? So if California is someone setting standards. Yep. You don't figure uh, California will be setting the standard for cybersecurity versus like 
all the cities should be adopting our standard or are they going to just go by the federal standard or something? Well, we have a privacy law, right? So the CP, California just has a new privacy law. And I think that's going to be, um, there's talk about what will happen in the federal government. I think we're making some privacy regulations this coming year. It's hard to say with the impeachment inquiry, but I think at some point in the next year or two, we will have a, a federal privacy law. It's coming, right? It, sometimes what the federal government likes to do, they like to look at the states as laboratories. <laughs> They like to see them like, well, it's not a bad thing though, because like if California doesn't say and maybe Texas does something or New York, and then you learn what works and what doesn't work. So that's, and then you, then you wait and see what sort of populates up and then you take the best of both. And that's happened. Um, we'll have to see where it goes. I think the Facebook issues and Cambridge Analytica have really pushed the envelope on these issues. And I think we're, we're likely to see something definitely within the next two years. Do you figure California would be the second target and if we were we're done with New York, we hit it enough? You know, cyber attacks, you say, oh, something bad. Well, oh, I think we hear it happens all the time, we're yeah. just not hearing about it. I mean, we have cyber attacks and ransomware attacks constantly, and hospitals are paying them off. I mean, that's definitely an yeah. issue. Yeah. Any uh, uh, questions from online or? No, we don't have any. Oh. Um, I am absolutely amazed by the uh, amount of work that was represented by your presentation. And um, would you consider most of the people that were involved in that work that you did to be in information security? No, so it's kind of funny. I mean, I think we, were, we considered ourselves to be running programs and being policy makers. I think I come from, I have a very security minded approach. I think because I really like security. Mm -hmm. Even I don't have any of the, I, I get to, it's like everything, you know, I can do it for a while and then I hit the wall. And then there's like the limit of knowledge that I have. But I definitely, I think I, I'm good on NIST 853 and the stuff with healthcare. I think I've got, I understand mobile-based access. I understand redundancy. Um, I don't know if my colleagues at ONC, there definitely is a, a sector of ONC that has a lot of real, like very security, very technical folks. I don't know if my group had that sense as yeah. much, but they certainly appreciated it. I'm not necessarily talking about technical, but I mean, that just seems like across the country, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, tens yeah. of thousands. Yeah, there were. And it's all um, either compliance governance. Yep. Or yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I had no idea it was that the intensity of it. What well, we funded, um, well, we funded, I think, 62 regional exemption centers. Um, each of them received some baseline funding and then $5,000 per provider. And these regional exemption centers were stood up to then support this adoption. So they they hired all these people who were then grantees, right? Which is what the government likes to do because they put all these people on the payroll. So ONC went from a, a policy shop of seven or eight people or 10 people to 200 people in a year. And then we had all these grantees. So we had grantees both the regional and central center side as well as the health information exchanges. There were 50 of those as, as well. Some of these regional extension centers are still around. Some of them have gone, have gone away. There were three buckets, I would say, of those RECs anyway. They were, came out of universities and colleges. And then there were ones that came out of HIEs. And then there were ones that came out of sort of other types of groups. But those were like, there was a lot. We also had a whole education piece that was both the university education piece as well as a community college piece. We did a huge amount of funding to community colleges to educate everyone and try to get cybersecurity out there and this implementation in general. Because implementing electronic health records is really hard. You're implementing to a group of people who don't really have technology background often. Um, and I think what, what's hard about EHRs is that they're de generally developed by people who are not clinicians, for clinicians who then also are not technologists. So you need, like there's this gap there on implementation where you really need people who understand it. Besides the security piece, you just need IT people who understand workflow and workflow analysis, who understand requirements gathering. There's all these pieces to an implementation, and I think you know, healthcare is still really struggling with this. They're really struggling with security um, because when healthcare is so fast-paced that there's so little time to think about anything else, and it's hard to find technology people who understand healthcare and want to work in that crazy environment. You really need to love it. Um, and then it's hard to find providers and, and people who understand who want to understand technology. And so and it's, a, it's a space that's really growing so rapidly and evolving so quickly that we've gone from electronic health records now to enormous amount of data analytics firms. Optum is huge. It's a huge firm that's got United Healthcare 
Um, and you've got a lot of this exploring, there's a lot of apps, there's a lot of research, so there's just so much happening in this space that I just see it as a really right place for cybersecurity folks to go because that it's just just what happened. Mention that because we've had an increasing number of cybersecurity questions happening at uh, UCSF. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the degree to which the speed with which people move up into yeah. some really interesting jobs. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, two years ago, you were like figuring out how to do your basic IT stuff, and now you're setting up supercomputers to analyze, you know, cancer. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much happening. AI is huge. Yeah. Um, Artificial intelligence today can identify tumors in radiology images um, more than people can. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's and there's a lot of research going, but more and more it looks like that's pretty uh, much a done deal. Like the AI can work much better than people at, at identifying cancer. Um, I think that the AI is a huge revolution in healthcare, and that you just need people who understand the technology. I think getting, if you can get certified by a company like Epic, for example, as about as you. About almost seventy percent now of the market, or seventy-five to seventy percent of the of the healthcare market, like the sky's the limit of what you can do. We have students who are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. very lucrative, very fun. Um, and there's other EHR companies. Cerner is another one. The Clinical Works is what we implemented in New York City. Um, and all of those. So just to answer your earlier question, because I don't think I did get it on the slide. So the way HIPAA works is that you have covered entities. So they're hospitals, doctors laboratories, pharmacies, they, are, they have to comply with the HIPAA privacy rule and the HIPAA security rule, which means they can't disclose information except for treatment, payment, and operations without patient authorization, unless they fall under a permissive sharing or law enforcement comes in, and even that's very tightly controlled. Um, outside of that, those folks, in 2013, we revised HIPAA to really make business associates as responsible for protecting the data as um, as the covered entities themselves, and so that's a that was a really important change in the law. On top of that, covered entities have to make sure that when they're sharing the data, that they're giving it to someone who can secure it. And so, for example, um, when I have I get a lot of data requests, right? And that's my job is to make sure that when we're releasing data, it's done correctly and legally and complied with the law. We work hand in glove with the Chief Information Security Office to make sure that okay, I can identify that you're okay giving the data. You have a contract, I have a business associate agreement. That's great, we can do this. But can you secure it? That's the other question. And that's where the Chief Information Security Officer comes in and does a full review and determines that they can review it. Otherwise, the covered entity is not ensuring the information that they can see. So that, you can't just slap a business associate agreement and say they're my DAA and we're good. You have to ensure that they're safe. So that's another type of job working for um, you know, hospital systems, making sure that, you're, that where you're sending the data is secure. That's a total information security job. And you know, I've, I've talked a lot about the federal government, but city governments and county governments can also be great places to work. Um, the job I have now is amazing. County of Santa Clara is a fantastic employer and is a great place to work. So don't just think about federal, you've got city and county. It's also a good place to get experience. You'll get more experience working for a government than virtually anywhere else. And because they, they need people and there's just so much happening that you'll just learn a ton of stuff. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So I think we're going to take a quick 10 minute break and for those of you who want to do your presentations today, we'll come back and do your presentations at 737, shall we come back at 747, we're going to pause the video and then we'll come back. <laughs> we still have two more minutes, so wait for everybody else to come back.
Like the no to get card scam rooms. I think this is gonna be a useful presentation. <laughs> you don't? I do, this, I don't know what it is. This is my favorite. Yeah, this is yeah. it was a, it was a new and it, this is a, actually a, a real life example uh, because I didn't know what it was either until it happened to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, to my company. Oh, yeah. I, I work for a small nonprofit, uh -huh. and we're not a target for most things because we're a small nonprofit and we don't have money. <laughs> All our clients are poor people. <laughs> um, so we're not a big target for anything like ransomware, although we did get hit by ransomware once. I think that was just random, but these targeted phishing attacks are just crazy. Because yeah. they'll go after, you know, they'll try to, well, we'll talk about it a little bit, but they figure any company or organization has some kind of funds that they're moving around within the company, right? Like, regardless of what we're doing with clients or in the world, but, you know, we have vendors and stuff like that. So they'll, they'll go after anybody. So I was surprised that we would be even, like, publicly out there enough that somebody would take the trouble yeah. but i guess it's lucrative all right so okay seven are we ready to go Our time has started great are we the shares back on yeah oh okay great We're recording. Uh, all right i'm stacy and i'm talking tonight about why gift card scams work i work for a small nonprofit, and we didn't consider ourselves to be a target for anything in the cybersecurity space until we realized that we were. And the way we realized that is through an email exchange like this, which starts out really vague. First, you know, can you do a quick errand for me? And that email supposedly comes from me and goes to somebody who's um, lower than me on the org chart. And she says, sure, what do you know? What do you want me to do? And then this is very detailed email about, can you get, go to a store and get some gift cards? And then I need you to do it right away and let me know that you've done it. Do you have a corporate credit card? If not, you can use your personal card and I'll reimburse you. Um, and then, you know, you know the, the positive response, sure, I'll go do that. I'll use my credit card because there's somebody trying to be nice. Um, and then again, very detailed things about Google Play gift cards and scraping off the silver lining, um, revealing the pin, sending a picture. Now, this to me is like, looks crazy like who would think that that was actually me this is not something i've ever asked anybody to do it's not an amount of money that we would throw around like oh yeah a thousand dollars worth of gift cards sure let's just like throw those out there but there are some factors that made this be compelling enough that somebody got in her car and went out to the store and bought started buying gift cards until the director of operations figured out what was going on and got on the phone to her and said return those right now and fortunately it was in time but you know I was stunned that this would be compelling, but apparently it's really common. People fall for it all the time. We've had since then two other incidents where we've gotten similar emails and at least a couple of people in my office have started this conversation with people. They haven't gone down the road this far, but it works. And there's a few reasons, there's some reasons why it shouldn't work, right? Like the email address, that's not my email address. I mean, you know, and that was visible in her email that that's like some random email address. That's clearly not my work email address, right? <laughs> Um, the signature is not really right. That's not the way I sign my name. You know, I would normally give, a full, I have a footer, right? That's our kind of standard footer. Um, there's typos that you can see that Outlook has picked up a bunch of, you know, cards doesn't have an apostrophe, all kinds of things like that. Um, there's, there's an area code in there that's a DC area code, right? So this is what you want to text the, the, the codes to, it's a DC area code. Um, we don't have corporate credit cards. So do you have a corporate credit card with you? We have one corporate credit card that always lives in accounting and everybody knows that. So I would never say to somebody, do you happen to have a corporate credit card? It's not a thing. I would never ask anybody to use their personal card and reimburse without a whole lot more, you know, ceremony around it than that. Um, and it's not anything I would ever ask anybody to do, right? It's like crazy, but it worked. So, okay, one minute left. So quickly, why does it work? It works because the apparent source is an authority figure. I'm higher than her on the org chart. Urgency. The email said, you know, said repeatedly, you know, I need you to do this really quickly. It's important. Plays on the desire to be helpful. The email also said, you know, this is really, you know, um, can you help me out here? This, can you do me a favor? And then there were some details that were accurate. We really do have someone named Sarah on our board. 
Um, so somebody had done some recon. They realized they figured out that I was, you know, at the top of the org chart. They figured found somebody who was lower than me on it and figured out some board member kind of third party and got a real name for it. So these things all work. So somebody's done their homework and that's why it works. And the prevention is tough because you're not gonna, your, your spam detector is not gonna pick up an email that basically just says, hey, can you do me a favor? Um, so the only thing you really have is user education, you know, go through phishing for, with people repeatedly, um, and your internal policies and procedures. Don't let money get spent without paper and without, really without wet signatures, because we're a small company and we can do it that way. Um, so, okay, Perfect. that's all I have. Any questions or? Did you do user education after that? I did. did. I yeah. sent out a phishing, um, Google has a little phishing test site. Oh, really? um, I sent that out to everybody um, and that we didn't have it happen again for six months. And then by that time, everybody had forgotten. Yeah. And so we had to do the same, you know, then I had to like talk everybody through it again to look what to look for. You look for the, um, look for an email address that's not, an, you know, our corporate email address, um, you know, so many other things, errors. Things that don't sound like the person. Again, we're we're very we're a small organization. We all know each other. We know how you know we know kind of how our speech patterns. So if somebody says something that doesn't sound like me, it's okay to question that. And that really is a lot of it. Is it's okay to question it even if it comes from me, right? It's okay to say this doesn't sound right. So. Thank you, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do I unshare? Oh, so I'm or can you just do top. that? It says stop sharing on the red. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I think we might have a comment or a question. Not yet, but did you want to do it from your computer? Yeah, I can over. Okay. So if you want to come back around. So um, go ahead and log in, Steve, to your computer. Okay. And I'll walk you through how to set that up. Thank you. All right, so go on ahead and um, one, where's your presentation? Let's go ahead and open that one up. Or did you want to use it off the drive? I hope I just didn't lose it. <laughs> you just Here had it. <laughs> go, go ahead and open up your presentation. Okay. Right, and then open up a browser. So it could be Chrome or whatever. So you want to go to samsclass.info. So we're going to get that Zoom link from him. I'm going to look for the CNIT 160. Right there. And then if you scroll down a little bit, there's a little bit further, the Zoom link is right there. We should launch and join the meeting. Then go ahead and hit share. And then you should see your slides. Oh, cool. Yep. And then just click the little blue That's button that simple. says share. And then now we'll see it. And if you want to present it, you can hit the little projector yeah, right. on the very bottom. Yeah. All right. So, um, give me a second. Looks like we have a chat. Um, oh, yeah. I thought I saw that one. <laughs> You're right. I should have stopped the recording. Anyways, uh, we're about to start again. Oh, and I am echoing. Did somebody not mute it? Steve, did you mute? You mean mute within the share thing? Mean mute. No, I muted your microphone so we don't have to. Oh, okay. Right. right. So, um, so, oops, did you mute your microphone? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Let me start the time. You ready? Yep. Four minutes, and I'll tell you when you have one minute left. Okay. Right. Start. Okay. So um, my uh, presentation is on something light and simple: um, <laughs> cyber and nuclear war. Uh, I love reading apocalyptic science fiction. Uh, my wife does too, and so we think about this stuff all the time. And uh, I just thought I might explore it a little bit. And so to do this, we need some vocabulary right off the top. All right. 
Here's uh, the vocabulary of the nuclear apocalypse. Um, does anybody know what MAD is in the context of nuclear war? Go ahead, Caitlin. Mutually assured destruction. Yes, mutually assured destruction. You don't, might not realize this, but we're all constantly living in, under this uh, framework of uh, policy across the planet where um, the only thing that is kind of holding nations in check in terms of uh, starting large-scale wars is this arrangement where an, one nation can, you know, you can have fights and battles and all kinds of smaller engagements, but, you know, when it comes down to it and somebody's, a big country's really losing, if it comes down to whether they're going to be annihilated or not, they're going to launch their nuclear weapons. And if they do, then the other side can actually detect and launch their own, right? Um, before, um, before they get annihilated. And so you basically have something like this happening. Boom, right? And everybody's gone. That's the the framework that we live under right now. We don't think about this all the time because it would drive us crazy. But, um, uh, and that's a whole nother topic. You know, it, we don't think about it because it'll drive us crazy. Therefore, we don't do anything about it. We could elect politicians who don't want to live this way, right? Um, the other vocabulary word is attribution. This is really important in, in a nuclear war and in any kind of cyber war as well. We need attribution is where you can know where an attack came from and kind of what it did because when you respond to a military attack you usually respond in sort of a commensurate manner almost an equal response that's how uh, countries kind of keep each other in check um, and attribution is an extremely important concept in cybersecurity. i'm going to do a brief comparison here between some of the factors uh, involved in nuclear and cyber war and how they compare um, cost of an attack in nuclear war is huge. Hundreds of billions of dollars to uh, develop these weapons. The, in cyber warfare, it's minuscule in comparison, right? Very little cost. Cost of retaliating, the same. Great for nuclear war, very small in cyber war. Um, the ability of, power, of countries to sort of have equal power with these tools in nuclear warfare. A rich country basically can afford cyber weapons. A small country cannot, but in cyber warfare, you got it. in cyber warfare, um, you can have a small country, let's say Iran, North Korea, um, that uh, can basically do the same kinds of attacks that a large country can do. So there is potential parity of forces. Um, we just talked a little bit about attribution, nuclear warfare. You can tell where nuclear weapons came from. You can tell and you can respond. Um, cyber warfare, most of the time you have no idea. So you don't know who to fight back against. Uh, I'm gonna skip that last one there because we're running out of time. Um, cyber warfare, um, it, one of the implications of cyber warfare is that if a country gets a really significant edge in cyber warfare, it is in their interest to attack, right? Because pretty soon somebody's gonna catch up and there's no costs of attacking if they can't find out where it came from. Um, and some conclusions, uh, the nuclear MAD framework. All right, we're done. Just let me make this one last point. It's actually more stable than cyber warfare. Um, cyber warfare, you can't necessarily respond appropriately. And uh, when you think that cyber warfare, that they may have taken up positions within our country already, and we may have in theirs. Ah. Okay, sorry. Um, and that you could possibly have nuclear responses to cyber attacks and vice versa. It just seems like a more chaotic and um, really unbalanced, worrisome situation compared to the balance of math. All right, thank you. minute um topic two is due tonight so if you haven't submitted your topic just email it in for our second presentation if you haven't done your presentation yet please go ahead and get that done soon thank you glad oh, yeah, next week out your well. paper is due yes your <laughs> paper is also due for your first presentation next week make sure you write it 
and turn it in. If you have any questions, email Sam. <laughs> I'm not Sam. Wait, you're not giving a lecture now? I think we're good. I'm it's kidding. like eight <laughs> o'clock. I don't think anyone wants to stay online. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.